why don't we now hear from the aviation side of the industry uh, and from Tracy. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you for having me. I've heard some very good words this morning, words that make me incredibly happy. Those words are sustainability, corporate responsibility, safety, the future. And uh, I'd like to uh, thank SGS for allowing me to come and present today. SGS is who I work for, um, the world's largest inspection, verification, testing and certification company. And uh, our slogan is when you need to be sure. And uh, that basically says it all. And uh, in particular, uh, I would like to talk about safety and aviation safety. Uh, I belong to a smaller little group in SGS called SGS Heart Aviation and we're a team of 27 ex-airline pilots, airline engineers, um, sorry this is just skipped, ex-airline engineers and we've, we devote our careers now after we've hung up our wings and our, and our engineering equipment to making sure that air travel, be it large airlines or small charter companies, are safe and also efficient. But there's something that started in aviation about four or five years ago which really made my university uh, academic career as well as my aviation career change directions very quickly. And that was the exciting area of drones where I began my PhD in unmanned aircraft systems safety, mainly involving the human interaction. So um, I'd like to thank Dell Tech for letting me show you this video. And drones are not only the future, but the future. the full video because we're a bit short on time but it probably won't take too much imagination to actually think about all of the amazing things that you can do with drones and uh, there's not really a day that goes past that I don't see something that horrifies me in the newspaper and um, last week I saw lines of peak hour traffic and above all the drivers that were stuck in the in the traffic were DJI Phantom drones, um, actually DJI Inspire drones, carrying signs on where people can actually get their uh, hamburgers and and uh, that sort of thing at the next stop. So that's pretty horrific. This slide that you can see in front of you basically depicts something that is um, really very true, sadly. At the moment, there are so many applications, and you will see more of them, that everyone's so excited about drones. The barrier to <coughs> entry is actually quite low. And uh, the, the downside of that is that the FAA and the International Civil Aviation Organizations have deemed drones as aircraft. And also, anything that flies higher than a blade of grass is aviation. So all of a sudden, we have aviation in a complete state of chaos, like none that we've ever seen before. Because we've got, you know, lawyers who are bored becoming drone operators, <laughs> or accountants, or, you know, it's not too much to change a career. And the applications are, quite frankly, very, very exciting. Unfortunately, it's only been uh, fairly recently that a lot of countries have come on board to uh, legislate the use of drone technology. 
And uh, you know, that is a good thing. But as you can see from the pictures here, the accident rates and the chaos and the non-compliance is incredibly high. But the thing is, is nobody gets hurt when you crash a drone. So does it really matter? Like, if no one gets hurt, so, so what? Just crash it by another one. Yeah, well, the thing is that uh, the picture you see now in front of you, the, no one got hurt during that crash. And that wasn't me flying at that, by the way. Um, these were actually pilots who were quite experienced pilots who got in f behind an aircraft that they didn't have a lot of experience in and uh, they lost control of it on the runway and they crashed but you know, nobody got hurt so are you just gonna go buy another one that'll be okay not really even if you crash a small drone it rec does represent considerable loss um, drones can be anywhere from three or four hundred dollars to a hundred and fifty thousand dollars or more especially for commercial applications so the fact that they crash and you lose it represents a huge loss to industry that are employing them for commercial purposes. So that brings up a whole new can of worms that SGS is now very heavily involved in, in uh, driving and bringing home and educating to the public. I was an airline pilot for many, many years for Virgin Australia. I went from flying a 72 tonne aircraft <coughs> to a two kilogram aircraft. Um, but my question to you is, is if I'm your commercial drone operator doing a traffic survey or road survey, do you want me to operate that drone with any less level of professionalism that I would operate my 737? The FAA and the aviation professionals around the world say no. You should be operating with the same level of professionalism as you would in any other aviation activity. And uh, that's what we're trying to educate drone operators today. <coughs> The problem with operating a drone is they crash a lot. Uh, still, because the barrier to entry is very low and there are not many established training programs that really focuses on high levels of aviation safety, um, there are about uh, probably 90% of the drones that crash out there in, the, in doing commercial operations today are through the fault of the, the driver, the pilot. Um, the figures that you see on the screen in front of you, these were actually taken from highly trained military drone pilots. So highly trained military drone pilots who are actually aviators, they might have come from flying fast jets and they've been relegated to flying drones. They're still making 60.2% of their accidents are based on their human factors. Just human error, misjudgments and different factors. So you can imagine that if you get someone who's sick of being a lawyer and they go and start a drone company uh, with no aviation background and no aviation training, maybe the minimal amount of le legal um, uh, qualifications possible, what do you think their accident rate is going to be like? It's, we've estimated definitely around 90%. Now, what this represents is a huge amount of loss. It also represents um, a damage to the sustainability and the, the, uh, the continuing efficiency of the drone industry, which we would like to support and cultivate. The thing is, it's flying a drone and flying an aircraft it is actually a lot harder and a lot more human factor challenges in flying a drone. In fact, 300 more um, human factors challenges we face when we actually fly a drone and some of the reasons for that are up there on the screen um, you know we have we're looking through artificial intelligence uh, artificial displays <coughs> often employing artificial intelligence we've got differing levels of automation you can control some drones on an iPhone or an iPad but others need a complex um, cockpit like you would see in a regular aircraft Often the teams are co-located or dispersely located, so it's not just like you're sitting in a cockpit controlling the aircraft. Often the person who is controlling the aircraft will be in a box somewhere far away or perhaps in visual line of sight to the drones. As we go more into the future, the, the um, drone operators are going to be more and more re remote and they'll be beyond visual line of sight operations. So what makes it more challenging for us and, and what will make it more challenging for you in the transport industry and what you have to be aware of moving forward is that when you operate a drone, this sets up a whole different relationship with the aircraft. 
there's a, a lack of shared fate, which means exactly that if you crash the drone, you're not going to die. And uh, unlike, if you all have seen the movie Sully, um, one of my favourite movies, I was actually in New York when Sully landed on the Hudson. And, uh, you know, when you are a pilot of a large aircraft with people behind you, your motivation to solve the problem at hand is very high. Not only do you not want to be killed, but you want to obviously keep the, your passengers safe. So that's called we share the fate with the aircraft. In a drone, we don't share the fate with an aircraft, and that sets up human susceptibilities like being complacent, being lazy, getting distracted easily, giving up if the problem becomes too hard to solve, disposability, if it crashes, we'll just buy another one, especially if you've got a big budget, and, uh, and also the accountability. We're seeing a lot in the industry at the moment, drone operators actually, for a long time, in many countries, not just here, we're actually operating without legal compliance because you can kind of put it in a box and then run away really quickly when the job is over and probably no one will catch you. Um, so that's really interesting. And also the commercial pressure to get the job done is very high. Interestingly enough, um, the photograph there, does anyone know who that guy is with the bloody fingers? That's uh, Enrique Iglesias. He decided to introduce a drone at one of his con uh, concerts a couple of years ago with some very bad uh, consequences. He reached up, the drone actually um, cut his fingers so badly the concert had to be cancelled. He had to have expensive plastic surgery on his gorgeous hands. And uh, apparently he also cancelled the rest of the concert. So I think that one incident of introducing a drone into your operation without probably considering the consequences probably cost poor old Enrique quite a few hundred thousand dollars and his hands are scarred so not very nice so what are the other costs I mean Enrique lost a lot of revenue there from his concert cancellations but now commercial operators are finding that the losses from having just even a small drone crash or uh, not return with their data can be huge. So listing a few of them there, obviously equipment damage and losing the drone is not good. Um, collision with a, with a helicopter or an air, manned aircraft will happen. Um, hopefully it won't, it won't uh, cause any, any major problems, but the statistics are um, showing that it is going to be on the cards. Um, lost <coughs> data, the fifth point down there, um, I once had a client who, uh, we were doing an environmental survey, the, the drone lost link, lost C2 link and flew away. Unfortunately it landed in a crocodile infested swamp and nobody would go and get it. <laughs> and <laughs> that data represent a, represented just the data alone, $120,000. Um, there is a funny end to that story. They did get the drone back. They managed to go out and get boats and all sorts of things, and but obviously the data couldn't be retrieved. So sometimes the data is more expensive than the whole drone itself. Also, uh, a big thing now that um, I would really like you to take home, and it's mentioned in the white paper that I've written, is the, the uh, legislative um, non-compliance the, the safety, the requirements the FAA puts down for you to be safe carries legal ramifications and that can represent a lot of loss as well. So integrating drone operations into your operations, whether that be looking at trans, uh, transport uh, traffic jams or whatever you decide that you want to integrate a drone, um, you do have to keep in mind some of the things that can go wrong and some of the challenges ahead of you. And this even includes um, uh, the battery management. Um, lithium polymer batteries are classified as an IATA dangerous good, as you probably are aware. They can, pop, they can pose very um, severe risks to aviation. And uh, uh, this was actually a drone operator who uh, transported his lithium batteries all squashed together and it put, got put in the cargo hold of the 737, and, uh, which was an, the aircraft I used to fly. And uh, luckily for the 156 passengers, sorry, 153 passengers and six crew, that fire happened on the ground, not in the air. Had it have happened in the air, that was a flight uh, Melbourne, Australia to Nandi, Fiji, and um, they would have ended up in the Pacific. So, 
serious considerations. So the white paper that I would love uh, you to come and talk to me, and I'll give you a copy, uh, talks to you about the different a different way to manage your risk because of the introduction of drones. Um, you may have heard of as low as reasonably practical. Um, that's a very aviation and industrial uh, method of risk assessment. Um, there's a new way of doing a risk assessment which is much more forensically defensible in a court of law and it helps organisations really be proactive with risk management uh, and that's called the so far. So far is as reasonably practical. <coughs> As I said, that focuses on due diligence and those favourite words, which are safety, sustainability. If you're interested in those words, you want to learn about so far as reasonably practical. And of course, that's what my passion is now, since I hung up my wings uh, two and a half years ago, is making the aviation industry and making the drone industry safe and sustainable for the future. So we're heavy <coughs> on collecting safety data and improving our training and improving our uh, risk management procedures so that we can make um, using drones in transport safe. Um, but we also do things like helideck certification and aviation audits and that sort of thing so it's quite a good fit for us and making sure that when you go and travel around the world that uh, you're getting put on a safe airline. So I won't skip through those. I just want to say thank you very much for your attention because I'm a little late. And um, please see me after. I'd love to talk to you more and share my white paper with you. Thank you. Question, please. Question. Yeah, Ms. Lay, I was wondering if you could uh, speak to uh, the issue of speak more to the issue of the use of drones in traffic management, monitoring, and uh, bridge inspection. Yes. My understanding is FAA is the de facto <coughs> responsible for setting rules and regulations for operation of drones. The two primary challenges are they have a restriction in place on operation of drones over live traffic and uh, I'm trying to think of the, of the second one. Um, it's slipping my mind right now. But can you speak more to that, to those challenges? In traffic management, uh, traffic monitoring, and bridge inspection. Yes, absolutely. And uh, you know, it, it is quite exciting, <coughs> exciting times for the FAA as well. And um, just to give you a, a bit of a bigger perspective, the um, International Civil Aviation <coughs> Organization is a branch of the United Nations. And they work to basically set recommended practices and standards for all of the regulatory bodies in, in the 192 countries around the world that are part of that organization. The FAA is one of them. And they have um, only just released in, uh, in August their rules for small unmanned aircraft system, which is below 55 pounds. Those types of aircraft um, are bound by legislation called Part 107. And exactly what you were saying, they're quite restricted in where they can operate. And one of the areas they're not allowed to operate in is over traffic, over a populous area, within 30 metres of a populous area. However, there are challenges with the FAA, that the FAA faces. Firstly, in enforcing those regulations is proving to be difficult because, as I said, drone, uh, drones are very mobile. They can be packed up and moved away. So enforcement is an issue. If, they, if the <coughs> operators want to operate drones over um, over traffic or over crowds or at stadiums or railways, they have to apply to the FAA for a 333 exemption or some kind of certificate of waiver. Now, in the interest, it's a great question because the only way they can get those certificates of waiver or 333 exemptions is to actually provide a safety case, a robust safety case. and. That includes not only how they operate, but the licenses and training of their um, drone pilots, but also a, risk a robust risk assessment of their aircraft reliability, their systems, their checklists, the emergency procedures, and their safety management system. And 
that's something that as the drone industry matures, there's going to be more emphasis put on that because uh, I think we are at the very beginning of what's going to be some very interesting times and uh, unfortunately it probably will take a few accidents for the vast majority to sit up and, and for those um, safety risk management cases to, to be more prevalent. Thank you. Thanks. We want to get to our next speaker. While she's sitting, I just want to mention the, the idea that drones are very easily obtainable. You can go into photography stores and just buy them. And, and they're incredible, if you think about it, incredible sources of data, data collection that will be that are integrated into smart cities and things. And I think that's part of a larger discussion that we could have afterwards. But uh, uh, this, is, this goes along with uh, the, the, the cloud, the data mine, uh, the collection of data by innovative ways. And we'll hear Kathy talk about the use of data. Question when I touch this, it's going to start. <laughs> Very good. We love technology. All right. Well, I'm here today without my partner, Gene. He had to stay back at New York State DOT. But he and I worked on this together, so I'm going to share his materials first and then jump into mine. And also, my uh, program manager, Eric Kranz, couldn't join us today. But we're here to talk about the future of that old mode. I like that term, Buzz. The old mode, new again. This is the future of New York State Ferry System. And so we're going to start out with understand. Uh, oh, we've got to have a few acknowledgments. But first, this is going to want to go forward, right? There we go. A few acknowledgments. Um, we want to thank uh, some folks at Federal Highways and folks at New York State DOT, and then some of my team there back at Avail. And my Avail shop is a data science shop, and we'll talk more about that in a few minutes. But we'll start out with thinking about the ferry system as it is today. So historically, this is one of the largest ferry systems in the nation, and it has the largest annual ridership. And it has the largest number of ferry operators, landings, terminals, routes, and the number of boats in service. And it also has three major routes that have intermodal connections, that is the interstate highway connect. So we have not only passenger ferries, but also vehicle ferry connections. And the ferries spread across all of uh, New York State. So we have the New York City Harbor, the Long Island, the Hudson, the upstate north, the upstate west. So we have a lot of interesting and current activities going on on the water. And here's just a, a little glimpse of some of the ways you can look at the ferry system uh, on Long Island and Hudson Valley and out to Lake Champlain. And so what Gene did is he went and put together a lot of data for our white paper. Um, he's got data here from, for ridership for 2014 and 15, looking at the trip origins, whether they're from New York State or others, and then the number of routes and the number of landings. And so we have well-known operators in the New York City Harbor um, area, and, and you can see that they have um, uh, varying amounts of traffic. So one of the things we see in the ferry system is it comes in small, medium, and large. And so we have to think about that when we think about how these systems will work together. And then we have additional operators that are um, not as well known but have some special services that they carry on. And so in the end, um, we, we have a big system there, but then going to the Long Island Ferry, Long Island Ferry has two types of operations, the intrastate, so that's all uh, looking at the New York side. For this, he only had data from 24, or 2013 and 2014. I'm expecting hopefully we'll have some new data <coughs> soon. But this gives you some ideas about the proportion that are um, in the auto traffic part and the proportion of the routes and landings. Then we have the interstate part of the Long Island Ferry System. So this looks at the connectivity and it gives you an idea that, again, not only do we have um, New York State involved, but we have other states. So that adds a level of complexity to understanding how the ferry system works. And then going to the Hudson Valley and to the upstate, we have systems that not only carry passengers, but also carry um, vehicles as well. And we also are looking at the ones that are coming on new in 2015. So the area of ferries is expanding. And so in total, we have an annual number of passenger trips of 47.5 million. And he's done a little <coughs> equation for you there. The number of vehicle auto trips, 2.5. The number of ferry operators, 24, with 62 
terminals and landings um, and 140 boats. Stay tuned, there's more coming. The Glencoe Ferry and the Lewiston Youngston to Niagara uh, on the lake coming in Canada. So in Gene's job, he is always thinking about how these ferries work and what's going on, but with an eye to the future. So he's thinking <coughs> about the workforce, a really important part of what's happening now, and especially the question about jobs we have, where will they go, jobs we need. So in his research, he found that in the state of New York, we have a very strong supply in the maritime industry, especially with our institutions. So we have students and faculty operating at Kings Point, we have uh, the SUNY Maritime and the Webb Institute, and joining our maritime institutions, we have major engineering institutions. So that's our SUNY Buffalo, Cornell, Clarkson, RPI, Columbia, uh, and Cooper's Union. And even with all of this exciting activity, students learning, faculty doing research, when he looked at the outcomes, how many of the boats are built in New York State in the last decade for all of these systems that we have, and he came up with a big zero. And then he looked at the number of shipyards in New York State, and he found one for new construction and two dry docks. And the issue is that if we're gonna be growing the ferry system into the future, we have to make sure that we figure out how we're gonna grow the support for this system. So he sees this as a job maker because there is indications from the maritime administrator that the country will need 70,000 more people to support the maritime fleet by 2022. So what are the kinds of things that we need to do? Well, there's reconstruction of the ferry infrastructure, which was mostly built in the 50s through the 70s, um, and it needs to accommodate not only the current volumes, but all the potential of the new volumes and the new vehicle sizes and the new vehicle characteristics. Um, and and uh, Gene found that there were five routes with significant auto crossings that needed to be investigated as well. So there's a whole area of jobs, jobs, jobs that's going to be attributed to keeping the ferry system up and running and expanding it. But then he looked even closer at what the advantage of having ferries in our system is. And he looked at the um, LNG, the li uh, liquefied natural gas, which is that liquid form that's clear and colorless, odorless, non-corrosive, and non-toxic. And he found that we didn't have any current production of, uh, for LNG engines in the United States. Again, he found zero for his data. Uh, but there are real advantages, and some research that was done by New York City DOT, New York State DOT, um, and New York City was that it, they have found that if you can convert to natural gas, you will lower a lot of your um, particulates and your other uh, emissions to the point where it is an extremely interesting idea. And the research on this was very, very exciting. Not only that, when they looked at the cost, the diesel cost compared to natural gas, we see that um, the total gallons, um, you need more of gas in the total cost. Um, the, the looking at what's happening with the fuel um, markets, I think we'll have to have Gene give you more details on this, but there's opportunities to think about how getting into the fuels and getting into the operations can also create jobs and create benefits for the state. And then there's the safety side. So on the safety side, the indications of problems on the water very well illustrated August 30th in 2016 when we had a collision between uh, New York waterways and 10 kayakers near Pier 79. So with these kinds of problems, some of the solutions that the academic and the uh, private sector look to are electronic data devices for navigation and safe system monitoring. These could prevent water accidents and collisions. So not having these available uh, is an important um, safety area that needs to be addressed to get these, um, these systems up and available. And then the land-based control systems at major terminals and landings, we now have the ability to have technologies for remote boat controls that control the engine, the transmission, the steering, all of the systems can be controlled electronically, much like the drone world on the water. Um, and so that would also help prevent uh, hard landings like we had on the Jersey City Pier. So we want to use our ferries, we need to use our ferries, and we need to look at increasing our safety capacity by looking at these new technologies. And in addition, <coughs> the most exciting area for ferries right now is optimization of operations by reducing the manual uh, navigation or going to a full autonomized 
navigation system. We're going to have some driverless, well, driverless. These are going to be vessels that are not going to require um, a, a driver. And as a result, that has very interesting implications for how the whole ferry um, environment will be transformed. Just as we're expecting the autonomous vehicles to do the same on the land side, we're looking forward to some um, re very interesting advancements on the ferry side. So now let's take a, a stroll to New York City for a little case study. And today transit uh, passengers use their mobile devices, as, as we just heard, to plan their trips. Not only that, but in the New York City Harbor, there is a very aggressive expansion plan underway to increase ferry service at the same time that we are looking to see some disruptions in our subway service. So what are the opportunities that can be um, launched as a result of expansion and need to have the uh, moving public be able to make quick decisions on the fly? Well, there is a need from the perspective of those of us who work in transit and transit data for a new multimodal translation software that will harmonize the data and improve connectivity for transit riders. Now, it's very fortunate that we just, with the help of uh, some funding from NYSERDA, we just finished a project in my lab to look at harmonizing using software that does translations for MTA. And we took their GTFSR, which is their um, general transit feed specifications in real time, that is a special kind of data standard, and we were able to translate that into the Siri system, which is what's used on the buses. Now, this was a very, very interesting project, and it was one of the ones where we learned that the best way to do this is to get yourself a data scientist, because data scientists inside those clouds use application programming interfaces, and you can think of that as like the pipes that the data flows through, just like water flows through, and the, the programmers in the data science world make special faucets where you can turn on and turn off all this data that's flowing around. It is a new and very interesting way to work with the, this data, and it's one of the important ways that we see it's possible for data scientists to reweave the data strands. And so what you used to see in an Excel spreadsheet, now inside of these not that mysterious black boxes, are all of these operations and the application programming interfaces takes the data from its original generation and takes it through a lot of transformations. And for us in the, the world of data, this is really exciting because in the process of doing this project of translating one type of data to another, we discovered that using a caching process was extremely uh, um, time and cost efficient. So you can think about this if you're a data person, is that instead of reading every word, you instantly get the answer by using a caching uh, technology. And so the caching process was one of the big advancements we, that we got out of this first project. And then not only that, in order to do the translation, every single event had to be logged because the data in one system had to be transferred to the data in another system. And as a result, they built a big API that actually whatever you hear gets written down. It was a gigantic logging device. And this provided not only the success of the MTA project, but a very interesting way of having your eyes and ears on your data. So think about what this data looks like. So here's the GTFSR. Um, it's it's actually very artistic, but all of those different weavings are necessary in order to match it to this weaving, which is the, the, or the GTFSR going to the Siri. So if you think about how this is done, it gives you some idea about what's going on in that cloud <laughs> that your structures are working on. All of this has to be matched and has to be matched instantaneously so that this translation can happen every 30 seconds. So throughout the entire system, the identification of every uh, uh, car that you have in either one of your modes, ha the system knows where it is and how it's doing and where it's going to be next in the next 30 seconds. So with that, the question is, do we have the essential ingredients to now invite ferries to the translation? So we have GTFS, we have, which is the actually the scheduling backbone. We have the GTFSR, which is the real time, which we have on the subways. We have the Siri, which is on the buses. And now here's the question. What do we have for ferries? So we did some exploration. 
And when we add ferries to the data network, there are some challenges. So we need a source of machine-generated data that can track and trace the ferry traffic. It needs to be complete in order for it to be useful, and it's going to require the cooperation of multiple agencies and especially the private sector players. So when we went to look around to see what was out there, there is GTFS on the Staten Island Ferry, and it's available. GTFS, one of the things that's nice is it's made available so that uh, so people doing their app development can get to it. It's information on the terminals, the schedule for the weekdays, weekends, and holidays. And they also modify it when they have heavy weather or uh, low visibility, and it is always available on the web. So that was one thing we had. And when you want to use that data, it comes in a text form. So we have a GTFS analyst tool that actually spatializes the text data and makes it possible to see where all the stops are on the ferry systems. So that's one step, but that was only the Staten Island ferry. So now how are we going to get the rest of the ferries? Well, one day I was very lucky at UTRC to meet with the folks from NREX. And the NREX have the ability with, the, with smartphones to capture not only the aggregate formats, but also they are now creating origins and destinations. And the origins and destinations product, when we looked at it, it actually had people who had their phone in their pocket traveling on a ferry going through the water. So by isolating the um, origin and destination uh, NREX data traveling on the water, you could have real-time ferry traffic. So that's a possibility. Then there's the automatic identification systems that are required by the Coast Guard for certain ships of, of certain sizes doing certain things. It has the ship's identity, the type, the position, the course, the speed, all the things that you need if you're managing your vessels. Um, and it is required, so if you come under those regulations, you will be providing that data. And it automatically transmits this data and receives it for not only from ship to ship, but also from ship to shore. So that's a very interesting data um, possibility for this. And most wonderful <coughs> is we discovered that it can be accessed through an already existing application programming interface that requires permission, but that data is ready to go into action if we want to, to get it launched in. So now the most exciting thing, when those autonomous ferries arrive, they will provide us with a new source the operations data that is going to be used to do the controls and to make the operations happen will give us complete or partial data streams in real time because that's going to be necessary for the operations and it also could contain the, all of those same features that we had in the AIS and it could be made accessible through a new API. So now the question is could it be incorporated immediately into a harmonized data network? So we think the data may be out there, but the next steps are going to require to, uh, an ex exploration into determining if the region is interested in a multimodal transit data harmonization strategy. One of the advantages of this strategy is that not only would it work for apps and provide the services for um, folks to be able to get their trips planned, but it would provide a second-by-second -second event logging and listening device that would make it possible to optimize the operations across uh, jurisdictions, across platforms, and across modes. Something, from my perspective, which would be very exciting to get on-time performance and matching of trips and connectivity. So that's going to require some new translation software, depending on what's available, and some research to find out exactly how do we incorporate ferry feeds into these existing transit data networks that we have not only on the, on the New York side, but on the New Jersey side, and to develop a sustainable structure for maintaining this multi-agency data network for the region. And so between Gene and myself and Eric, we believe that you should be using the New York State ferries. It is an exciting new world for this old, uh, old mode. We're going to be able to create jobs. We're going to be able to be part of the new connected vehicles operations. But we think that the data value and the ability for the agencies and for the public to benefit are very, very large. And so thank you. go from 19th century ferries to 21st century data whiz, whiz kids. Questions for Kathy? <coughs> yes. Um, how much disruption is there from weather as compared to other areas? And how does the system adjust when, in fact, weather 
what, depending on to what degree it affects the ferry system? Well, that's where having the data would be very, very wonderful. Um, I've been looking at weather lately. I have another UTRC project where we're taking the Mesonet data every five minutes off of the new, uh, there's 125 new um, weather stations that uh, Homeland Security has provided for the state of New York. And the Mesonet produces this data every five minutes. And so we're doing the very first <coughs> investigation of the five minute increment data. And we think that, and this is looking at um, effects on the, the winds and the temperatures, but we think that having that mesonet data is going to make it possible to do micro forecasts so that you can at least, you may not be able to stop the weather, but you may be able to know it better. And so that's one of the areas that we feel um, in this research that weather, especially extreme weather, is really important. We don't have the answer yet, but we could shortly, if we can look at the data about the weather and then we look at the data about the operations of the delays and start understanding what that relationship is. And do you know how it affects it today with what we do know about weather? I understand that's a progress to make it better. Yes, there is, although I haven't been part of what their, their current findings are, but there is a big push to making that interface, that's the Internet of Things, making our systems more agile so that they can adapt, but I'm not familiar with what the exact um, ramifications are yet. Thank you. But they're going to improve. I have so much focus in the presentation today that kind of combine safety and guidance for moving people. I'm thinking especially in this region, we move a lot of goods, and I'm wondering if the conversation is expanding to include uh, communication and systems that can manage like this for the large container ships and for the many barges and tankers that we have, and tugboats for that matter, and nearby waterways. That sounds like great research that I'd love to get involved in. We are looking at um, a lot of freight. Uh, my team is the subcontractor to RSG, who is doing the New York State Freight Plan. And so we're looking at all of the data, and we're just getting it in right now. So I know they have been doing interviews with the, the ports and, and finding out what's going on. And there is no reason other than being able to put our attention to it that we can't transfer from one to the other. It'll be very exciting for freight. I think one, one of the interesting facts that you have to remember is that a lot of the innovations in data came from logistics, came from originally the container cargoes and, and the barcoding and the instant uh, stuff. So that it's going on. We have a uh, uh, UTRC as part of a Volvo Research uh, Foundation project with a number of other universities looking at the innovations in freight around the world. And uh, it's, it's as important and as growing as is, as is passenger. We had, I saw a hand up someplace in. Intermodal, so is this taking cars off the road or is it just shifting uh, cars to other spots? Well, that's, that, that depends on your perspective. One of the things we always have to think about is where are people starting and where are people <coughs> needing to go and what system works best for them. That's why I like that Internet of Things to give us the most choices. When we shift modes and we think about intermodal, getting the maximum amount of connectivity so people can make choices. If people are coming in on their vehicles and taking their vehicles onto the passenger ferry or onto the ferry and then continuing on with their their mission on the road, that may be a different public than is taking the passenger ferries, but it's going to depend on us making sure they have the best information to make that decision. So one of the things I look forward to in the analysis is bringing in the land side information on the land uses so that people can see how close or how far the places they want to go to are and help them make better decisions. But I think we are going to have forever a multimodal um, system and just being able to help maximize the system and minimize um, the excess use of one of the systems is what we're going to have to do. So I don't know if that answers the questions, but intermodal is here with us and now we have some tools to understand it better. You mentioned that natural gas was going to be something that was going to be... Can you use the mic? You mentioned that natural gas was something you were investigating because of the cost savings and the emission savings, but that suggests to me that there'll be some emphasis on fracking. So I was wondering if there's also some research into electric boats. I know Norway has one. Is there any research being done in that? I hope so. Well, be sure and ask Gene that when I get back. I think that the electric side and the solar side, we've seen some really interesting solar ferries um, 
uh, and, and solar vessels going on. So yeah, looking for the best, most um, uh, efficient and least polluting is one of the missions of the ferry research. So I would agree we want to look to get the, the electric. And especially if we have systems for doing the electric vehicles, we should look to being able to put that in the water as well. We, we've got to bring this to a conclusion, but we can uh, give a hand to all three. <laughs> Just remember, Bill talked about the cloud and the data, and we've already brought in before the hours up aviation and the drones and ferries as new modes. So before you leave today, you should have a dozen new modes to go to the cloud. Thank you all.